in this uh, conference, both uh, in live and online. Um, a few couple of housekeeping items. One, the paper uh, that uh, is available in hard copy, which is out uh, just to the left as you leave uh, this room, uh, is also available online at the same location that you use to register for the conference. And anyone who's uh, listening in to the live stream, you'll also find it in the, that, obviously, that same location, as are the slides that were also handed out in hard copy. Those are also available online. Uh, the, we do have uh, individuals that are live streaming uh, this conference. It'll also be uh, 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 filmed, and uh, that uh, audio visual will be available online uh, sometime later today or tomorrow once it gets uh, processed. Uh, in terms of the individuals that are participating through live streaming, if you'd like to ask a question, we do have the facility to do that. Uh, at the start, the, um, uh, we will be taking questions from uh, the audience, but we'll also be taking questions from the online audience. If you'd like to submit a question uh, in terms of the uh, online audience, go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter the code AEI event. Uh, all one word, uh, and then you enter your name, type in your question, and then that goes into a queue, uh, and uh, we'll be taking some questions from that queue. Uh, and with that, uh, I will turn it back to Alex. Thanks, Edward. We have one more housekeeping uh, item. We need the slide clicker up here on the podium, AEI colleagues. I don't know where it is, but we'll get it up here so our speakers will be ready to go. Uh, <laughs> you can just give it to Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, eliminating Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac without legislation, we all know. Fannie and Freddie were central to creating the great housing bubble and the ensuing crisis. We know they brought and continue to bring major distortions to the housing and housing finance markets. But getting legislative reform of them through Congress, as needless to say, proved to be a great Gordian knot, which no one has been able to untie, in spite of many efforts and much intense energy expended on it over nearly a decade. Can we cut the Gordian knot by fixing Fannie and Freddie without needing legislation. That is the proposal of today. Our expert speakers are going to lay out how that could be done, how the plan would correct the price and mark market distortions Fannie and Freddie create, and what the resulting primarily private housing finance market would be like. Let me introduce our panel in the order in which they'll speak. Peter Wallison will be first was a senior fellow at AEI, where he is a notable policy leader in many issues of financial regulation. Among other things, in his distinguished career, he was general counsel of the U.S. Treasury, White House counsel to President Reagan, appointedly dissenting member of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, and is the author of Hidden in Plain Sight, a compelling indictment of government housing policy blunders. Uh, Ed Pinto, is the co-director of AEI Center on Housing Markets and Finance, which has created AEI's mortgage risk and collateral risk indices, and has designed the wealth building home mortgage, among other things. Active in housing finance for more than four decades, there is little in the cycles of mortgage markets that Ed has not seen, although he has not yet seen the reform of Fannie and Freddie. Tobias Peter is a research analyst at AEI where he studies housing and mortgage markets, including their risks, interest rates, and the effects of Fannie and Freddie. Previously, he was with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Pat Lawler is an adjunct fellow at AEI, having been from 1994 to 2014 chief economist at the Federal Housing Finance Agency and its predecessor. There he led in the development of Fannie and Freddie's risk transfer programs, among other projects. Uh, before that, Pat was the chief economist of the Senate Banking Committee, uh, where he worked on the GSE Act of 1992 and numerous other banking laws. Thinking about that, I realized that these banking laws each were going to end banking crises forever as they were passed. 
Norbert Michel is a senior research fellow in financial regulation, financial markets, and monetary policy at the Heritage Foundation's Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. Uh, his studies include the long overdue reform of Fannie and Freddie, reform of the Dodd-Frank Act, and many other issues in financial regulation and deregulation. Steve Oliner is the State Farm James Q. Wilson Scholar at AEI and the co-director of AEI Center on Housing Markets and Finance and a senior fellow at the Zyman Center for Real Estate at UCLA. Steve spent more than 25 years at the Federal Reserve Board in economic and financial research. Uh, after Steve, Peter Wallison will be back to conclude the formal presentations. Uh, we'll then ask the whole panel to join me on the dais, and we will open the floor at that point uh, to your questions. Unless your questions run out earlier, we will adjourn promptly at 11 30. Getting Fannie and Freddie addressed at last. Peter, the podium is yours. Thank you, Alex. This is a great day for all of us. Our merry band started on this project about a year ago. And uh, this is the first opportunity we have had to make it public and explain why uh, we did that, why, why we did this, and what the result will be. Now, the only thing we have to worry about is whether the slides work. Um, okay. Not very visible, is it? You're good, Peter. Yeah, I'm good, except, can we see them on both sides? All yeah. right, we can see that. All right. Um, the charts we will be discussing today uh, illustrate most of the major points in the paper we will also be distributing today. The paper shows, I think without question, that the government's involvement in the housing finance system, primarily through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, has caused the instability in the price of homes that we will show you. Rising prices have also prevented low and moderate income families from buying their first homes. At the same time, as we will show, Fannie and Freddie are not necessary for 30-year fixed-rate mortgages and except by taking uncompensated risks for which the taxpayers have actually paid, they have not lowered mortgage interest rates. All of this will be made clear in today's conference. The slides you see, and you only see, you're only seeing two of them, um, will, in, in this series, the one on the left um, we'll talk about homes that are highly, um, uh, talk about the price of homes that are highly unstable. But the reason that we have started this project and the reason we are going through this today is because we think it is important to get the government out of the housing finance system. Uh, even though, if you look at the chart just to the, below the, the red line, just below the, the blue one, if you look at that, you can see that even though housing prices are very unstable, construction costs are stable. Um, that's an important point, and we'll make more of it uh, for, uh, as, as we go along. In this conference, we will show that government policies cause the instability in the housing market. The chart on the right shows automobile prices in terms of the U.S. median income. Again, this is a very large market, like construction, in which the government does not interfere. Uh, it is also a market in which people borrow to buy the product. And as in the construction market, buyers and sellers bargain with one another, and the costs remain roughly stable over time. The third chart, which I'm afraid we can't see, but there was a third chart. The third chart will show housing prices in terms of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, ordinary income, median income in the United States. And again, that data, if you could see that chart, and it is, I think, in the booklet that you will get, um, will also show that that market, the housing market, even in terms of median income, is very unstable. Accordingly, the purpose of our plan is to eventually return the housing market to stability 
by eliminating the government's role in financing homes. If we can achieve that, there is no reason to believe that the housing market will not function as well as the construction and automobile markets. Now, there's no slide. Okay. Uh, we developed this plan. Okay, I'm, I'm bearing. Will this, will this uh, count against my time, Alex? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are a tough taskmaster. Okay, well, in any event, we developed this plan because we do not believe that there will be legislation in 2018 or at any time in the near future that will reform the government housing finance system. There are major disagreements in the Senate Banking Committee and likely to be problems on the Senate floor. The House is working on its own bill, and if that were to pass, the two very different bills would have to be reconciled. There just isn't enough time this year. Moreover, the current system serves the interests of the realtors, the home builders, and the banks. These are the three main groups that are influential with Congress on this issue, and they will oppose significant reform. The only real chance for reform is to do it administratively without going back to Congress. And the rare chance to do that will occur in 2019 when President, Ray, uh, President Trump, excuse me. <laughs> I love the good old days. Uh, will be able to appoint a new director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Okay, FHFA is the regulator and the conservator of the GSEs, and as I will describe, it has unique powers as conservator to be able to, to use um, our plan and implement the proposals we are advancing. The plan involves two major steps, which we... <laughs> what? I thought you were going to your next slide. Oh, I'm not, not yet, not yet. The plan involves two major steps, which we'll go through, we'll go through in detail in the presentation today. First, we would gradually eliminate Fannie and Freddie from the housing finance market. Second, we would reform the, housing fin uh, the, hous the Federal Housing Administration so that it serves the interests of low and moderate income first-time home buyers. These steps will change the U.S. housing finance system from a government-dominated system to a stable, competitive, largely private market system operated by the private sector and based on free market principles like the auto and construction markets. This is a unique plan. No other plan will create a stable market, a uh, stable housing finance market, get the taxpayers off the hook for bailing out organizations like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, save the Treasury, as we will explain, billions of dollars every year, and assist low and moderate income families to buy their first homes. <laughs> at the end of this, this, this system is difficult. Um, at the end of this discussion, we will show you how the plan will work in detail. But here's a brief summary. Through a series of steps, we would reduce the conforming loan limits of the GSEs, that is, the maximum size of a mortgage that they can buy. As that occurs, they will become a smaller and smaller part of the market. In addition, we will also eliminate year by year other products and services they offer that have nothing to do with purchasing a home. As the wind down progresses, larger and larger portions of the housing market will be taken over by the private sector. Banks, SNLs, credit unions, and private mortgage-backed securities. Now I want to talk a little about, a bit about FHA's role because it is a key to what we are going to be doing. This cannot be done, the proposals we're, we're uh, advancing cannot be done because when the GSEs become insolvent in 2008, uh, became insolvent in 2008, they were placed in a conservatorship run by the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which is also the GSE's regulator. As conservator, 
the FHFA can take steps administratively to, to fully implement the plan. That is as conservator, not as regulator. In January 2019, the current FHFA director, who was appointed by President Obama, will have to leave office. President Trump will then have an opportunity to appoint his successor. If President Trump wants to achieve a permanent reform in one of the largest markets in the US, which is being controlled and badly run by the government, this is his chance. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Ed. Thank you, Alex. I'll be talking first about what effect government policies like the GSEs have on housing costs, particularly first-time home buyers. Huge taxpayer losses that have occurred for periodically with, from U.S. housing policy did not come about in spite of government support, but they came about because of government support. This is due to the fact that government housing policies create what I call an economics-free zone. Housing finance is actually uh, driven by a number of immutable laws that are related to economics. The first is the law of the marginal buyer. In a seller's market, uh, and we've been in one for 65 straight months, in the last uh, run-up in house prices, we were in one for 99 straight months, prices rise faster than incomes so long as the marginal buyer, who sets the price for all, has access to higher leverage. This uh, buyer not only determines price level, but also the degree of stability, or in cases where the government gets involved, instability, because price is not necessarily equal to value. Second, we have what I dub Fisher's Law. Ernest Fisher was the first chief economist at FHA back in the 1930s and professor after that. And he observed that in a seller's market, when choice is restricted, as it is today, and the seller virtually dictates sales terms, more liberal credit will actually be capitalized into higher prices, since there's nothing has been done to increase supply. And then I uh, add what I call the law of ignorance. Policymakers ignore these principles of supply, demand, and housing finance, and that results in this economics-free zone. Cross subsidies and expanded credit push up demand against a regulation-constrained supply. As a result, any government-centric solution will create instability, not stability. And that instability, and this is a very important point, will largely be borne by low and moderate income households. They tend to buy later. They tend to buy at higher prices because of that capitalization effect. They tend to buy with higher leverage. Um, and that leverage is going to drive up the land portion of the package that they're buying, of the house with the land. And when there's a turn in the market, they are the first ones and the hardest ones hit. Since the early 1990s, government housing policies have resulted in higher and more volatile home prices, particularly at the entry level. This uh, chart shows Case-Shiller uh, data for a um, little under 20 metro areas around the country. They've been tracking in price tiers, low, medium, and high. Each is a third of each market, each MSA, and they track how prices uh, are going in those markets. Uh, and we're able to take this back roughly to 1987. And you see in the early years of this uh, series, uh, the house prices went uh, in sync between low, middle, and high. Um, they pretty much went up together, and then they went down together. That all changed with the so-called affordable housing mandates of the 1992 Act uh, for the GSEs. And then we started seeing a divergence, and we started seeing low uh, the low price band go up much more rapidly than the medium and high, and then when the uh, price, the crash uh, came in 2006, 2007, the low price band dropped much more precipitously from that higher level, uh, so it was a deeper trough, higher peak, and the people that were hurt the most, of course, were the low and moderate income buyers who were buying somewhat less expensive houses. We then saw a trough in 2012, uh, and we've seen a continual uptick uh, 
evidenced by 65 straight months of a seller's market. So now we have the same policy mistake that was going on in uh, the 1990s and, and aught years happening again today with the government in complete and total control of the housing market. So the lessons learned in the 1920s when there was a housing crash in 1928, 27, 28, those lessons learned, lasted for about 25 years until the mid-1950s. What we find here is the lessons of the late 90s and the early aught years, the, the, the crash that occurs in 06, 07, the trough in 2000, and 12, those lessons lasted six years. We're, we've now repeated them, and we're into the sixth year of the same mistake. And, of course, that will end up hurting when the turn eventually comes, which it will, uh, hurting low- and moderate-income buyers. We see this, how this is done. It's done by providing first-time buyers with the most amount of leverage. And our National Mortgage Risk Index, which we've been publishing uh, now, goes back five plus years, um, the red line shows repeat buyers and the blue line shows first-time buyers. And what we see is that the repeat buyers have had pretty much constant leverage for the last um, uh, four and a half, five years. However, the first-time buyer has had a consistent upward tick led primarily by FHA, but more recently by um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have joined the fray quite substantially, particularly um, at the behest of their regulator, FHFA. Historically, affordable housing mandates, so-called affordable housing mandates, have eased credit, but they've promoted price instability. And I went back and looked at the various national housing acts and various enactments. In the 1950s, uh, the National Housing Act amendments resulted in the use of the 30-year loan uh, quite broadly for existing housing at FHA. That's when it was first introduced in 1954. Minimal down payments became much more commonplace with FHA, and that eventually spread to much of the rest of the market over the years. In the 1960s, Congress expanded uh, FHA so that it would be making loans to lower-income families unable to meet normal credit requirements. At least they honestly said that was our goal. We wanted to expand it to people who couldn't normally meet. Of course, they didn't do anything to expand supply, and so they're expanding demand with a constant, relatively constant supply. And therein, you know, the problem that I just referred to earlier. 1977, 1995, Community Reinvestment Act requires the use of so-called innovative and so-called flexible lending standards to address low and moderate income buyers. Again, innovative and flexible just means more leverage. In 1992, Congress mandates the GSE affordable housing goals. 2008, Congress makes those goals tighter and then adds duty to serve. So every housing bill that I've looked at for the last 65 years has had provisions to ease credit. Each, each was to make housing more affordable. Yet that has not been the result. That's been the stated purpose, but that's not actually what's happened. So more recently, there are many drafts and bills and plans, including uh, the latest, which is the draft by Senator Corker, and they are no different. The Corker draft says we will promote and ensure access to affordable mortgage credit and affordable housing, including underserved borrowers. We'll provide a mortgage market access fund, market access plan, market access agreements. The word access, which is the new buzzword that it used to be affordable housing goals, and then before that it was something else, uh, flexible and innovative. Now it's access. Well, that word appears 62 times in an 80-page bill, and as you know, each page has not that many words on it. Uh, whatever words are used, the result is always the same. While these bills were great at increasing demand, they do little or nothing to increase supply. These mandates therefore seek to give Congress what they call a free lunch, but ignore the fact that it is the marginal buyer who determines not only price levels, but the degree of stability. And that then creates a problem because, again, they've done nothing to increase supply. So what are the benefits of our plan for low and moderate income buyers, the Treasury, and taxpayers? First and foremost, a much more stable housing market, and that stability is what will help low and moderate income buyers. As I said, they're getting in last with the most leverage at the highest prices. By definition, that's a, a recipe for instability. So by having a more stable market, you'll have a more stable participation by low and moderate income uh, buyers. That, the 
greatly reducing the government's support will slow home prices and homes will become more affordable. Uh, down payment in dollars will be going up in smaller amounts. Uh, debt to income ratios will not have to increase so much. If house prices are increasing more in sync with incomes, you don't have to have constantly increasing debt to income ratios. The benefits for Treasury and the taxpayers are also large. One minute in your first half. Thank you. Right on schedule. <laughs> GSE securities compete with Treasury securities, and we estimate that eliminating this, eliminating this competition will save the Treasury $17 to $29 billion annual in interest costs. Steve Olner, my colleague, will talk about this at much greater length. Uh, it will reduce government guaranteed debt, which now totals about $15 trillion private debt, by $5 trillion. Uh, about 35 percent, and all government debt, including Treasury debt, by about 16 percent, and it will greatly reduce the risk of taxpayer-funded taxpayer, bailouts. So moving to the next topic, what do the GSEs actually do for prospective home buyers, and what does it cost the taxpayers to support the GSEs? Principal. And this is our, our whole plan is based on this fundamental principle, which we think there should be broad agreement uh, across all uh, sectors and across uh, uh, the partisan divide. The only plausible reason for the government to back the ho housing market is to help low and moderate income families buy homes. That's it. What is possible other purpose could there be? An evaluation of the GSE's 2017 business shows that the GSEs fail to meet this very simple test. In the immortal words of Gertrude Stein, there is no there there. And that's what I will now show with these three next three slides. Almost half the GSEs 2017 volume wasn't even relating, related to buying a principal residence. It was related to refi cash outs, the biggest slice on the pie, the second biggest is refi no cash out, and the third biggest, is, or the third one is the second home, an investor, all of which have nothing to do with buying a home for a, for, to live in as a, an owner-occupant. These borrowers certainly could have been handled by the private sector. I don't think anyone could possibly make a plausible argument that that's absolutely not true. Another 41% went to help well-to-do home buyers, which is, of which 25 percentage points went to well-to-do repeat buyers of primary residences and 16 percentage points went to well-to-do first-time buyers. And again, you see the remaining, the, the next four uh, slide uh, slices. And we've got first-time buyers um, with uh, down payments of less than 15 percent, but they're buying a, a home that has a loan of over $250,000 which means they're buying a house of something like $275,000, $280,000. That is not um, the, a, a low and moderate income buyer by and large. Secondly, you have first-time buyers that are putting 15% or more down. Uh, again, they have the wherewithal to do that. The private sector has a very similar um, uh, credit box for those buyers and could serve those buyers quite easily. Uh, you then get to repeat buyers that are putting... Uh, less than 15% down, but again, buying uh, loan, buying houses with loans of $250,000 or more. Again, you're talking about $275,000, $280,000 houses. Uh, again, these buyers have all of them have very high FICOs, uh, and so they really don't need uh, this assistance. In the case of the repeat buyer, the median house price is $365,000. The repeat buyer with less than or equal to eight, less than uh, 85 percent LTV. Uh, they are buying a $327,000 house. They have a 774 median FICO. Uh, and again, there's absolutely no reason why they need government assistance in the form of a government guarantee of their mortgage. That's really the question. Is, is there a reason for providing that government guarantee other than to help the housing lobby consisting of the realtors, the home builders, the mortgage bankers, is there really a public purpose for doing this other than to help the people that are going to be making a lot of money off of this, mostly through higher house prices, which again is in the antithesis of what the goal of uh, serving and helping low and moderate income households might be. So all of these buyers uh, could be served by the private sector. So we've now gone through 
and 90% of what Fannie and Freddie do or did in 2017 and are doing this year could be ha easily handled over time by the private sector. You just pull Fannie and Freddie away, which we'll go through that in greater detail in a few minutes. So we're left with 1 in 10 GSE dollars left, 1 in 10. And of those, 1 in 16 dollars, uh, uh, 6.5 percentage points, or 1 in 16 of the total, are going to first-time buyers of more modest homes, and only 3.7 percentage points, or 1 in 30 of the GSE dollars, are going to repeat buyers of more modest homes. The GSEs spend, according to our estimates, about $3 billion in cross subsidies a year. And I liken it to you have a piece of bread, and you've got one piece of bread over here, and you've got two pieces over there, and the two pieces that are, are more well-to-do, um, they charge more on those two pieces, and then they take the piece over here and they spread the $3 billion like peanut butter very thinly, and everybody gets a little benefit, and you end up at the end of the day with $5 trillion of outstanding loans because you're, you need all these loans in order to create this little bit of subsidy, this thin veneer of subsidy that gets spread around uh, for low and moderate income buyers. The private sector and the, a targeted FHA, a retargeted and reformed FHA, could easily replace the GSEs. We will talk about how the private sector can do that, and I. Uh, Tobias Peter, and I will talk about how FHA can do that uh, later on. With that, I conclude my second section. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, while Tobias is up, for those of you nice enough to be standing in the back to, to be with us, there are some empty seats. If you want to come up and find them, you are, are welcome. Hang on just a second to us. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Tobias. All right. Thank you, Alex. Without the GSEs, the mortgage market would not look radically different. It is often argued that the GSEs lower mortgage rates, that they ensure the availability of the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, that they support homeownership, and that they lend to, lower, to people with lower incomes or weaker credit profiles, all of which presumably the private sector would not do. But on all, on all of these fronts, the evidence is stacked against these claims. Let's start with mortgage rates. The GSEs no longer offer lower mortgage rates for borrowers despite a government guarantee that allows them to raise capital at a lower cost in the private sector. The main reason the GSEs were able to charge a lower mortgage rate in the past was by taking on risk for which they were not compensated. Since 2009, the GSEs have been forced to price for risk, which has driven up their mortgage rates relative to the private sector. And since 2014, mortgage rates for private portfolio whole loans have been about one quarter percentage point lower than mortgages offered by the GSEs. And that is after adjusting for the risk, for differences in the riskiness of individual loans. <clears throat> These are the key takeaways um, from a research study undertaken with my AI colleague, Steve Olner. In this study, um, we compared the mortgage rates of about 16 million closed mortgages originated between 2001 and the third quarter of 2017. Um, we specifically compared um, the rates of GSE loans right at or below the conforming loan limit. Um, the conforming loan limit is the maximum loan amount eligible for purchase um, by the GSEs. And we compared those loans <coughs> to, conform, uh, to private portfolio jumbo loans. So those um, are just slightly above the price of the loan limit. So these, lo these were loans that are outside of the reach of the private sector. We believe that the best guidance on what would happen to mortgage rates if the GSEs were il eliminated is by comparing loans with similar characteristics but that are outside of the reach of the private sector, uh, of the, of, that are outside of the reach of the GSEs. Um, we also conducted many robustness checks, which all confirmed our results. And if you'd like to know more about the research study, um, you can find the entire paper in appendix two of our plan. <clears throat> 
The main findings are summarized in this chart here. And the blue line shows the rate differential between jumbo portfolio loans and the GSEs. A positive rate differential means that the GSEs are charging a lower rate than portfolio lenders. A negative rate differential means that the GSEs are charging a higher rate. And before the financial crisis, you can clearly see um, the undercharging um, of the GSEs as the, the they had a price advantage over the private sector. But this also explains the massive buildup of housing risk before the financial crisis. During the financial crisis and its aftermath, the rate differential widened. And then once the GSE were forced to price for risk um, um, in 2009, the, right, the, the rate differential narrowed until finally since 2014, um, the rates of the private sector have been consistently about a quarter percentage points below the rates of the, G of the GSEs. It's also interesting um, that this rate advantage of the portfolio loans over the GSE loans not only applies to loans around the conforming loan limit, it, it rather applies to loans across the entire loan spectrum. And this rate differential was wider for lower priced loans. This is again after adjusting for risk. Our plan calls for a stepwise reduction of the conforming loan limits. Based on what the market looks like today, the private sector is well positioned to absorb the GSE's volume. Here's why. Despite the GSE's dominant role, the portfolio market is already very active. Using the latest Humda data for 2016, private portfolio lenders originated a total of $228 billion for about a quarter of all 2016 conventional mortgages um, which were also spread out across the entire loan spectrum, which you can see from the last column um, in this chart, in this table. And you will also notice that even um, for the loans with the lowest loan amounts, the private sector accounted for about a quarter of all loans. So if one were to eliminate the GSEs completely, these data support that the private sector is already well established um, to expand from its current levels to absorb the GSEs volume. But what about the 30 year fixed rate mortgage? Well, data from CoreLogic suggests that the private market is able to support a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage on its own. Um, as you can see from the chart, 76% of private portfolio purchase mortgages in 2017 were 30-year fixed-rate mortgages, which is not much below the 85% of the GSEs. Based on these data, it is simply not true that only the GSEs can ensure the availability of the 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. The GSE's impact on promoting home ownership is also largely overstated. In fact, the GSE are doing a pretty poor job of serving low and moderate income borrowers. Of all the mortgages that the GSEs acquired in 2016, so that is counting refinances, second homes, investor homes, and primary purchase loans, only 14%, so that's one four, only 14% went to buyers with an income below the area median purchasing a primary residence. Furthermore, the majority of GSE borrowers are quite well off. This chart here um, shows um, the median income of GSE and private portfolio borrowers as a percent of the area median. Plan affected GSE borrowers, those are the, the blue bars within the, the red box, had a median income 60% above the median income of all households in the metro area. These borrowers do not need a government guarantee. But what about low income borrowers? Well, the same Humda data show that borrowers with loan amounts below $417,000 served by the private sector had median incomes below that of GSE borrowers. And as I've shown on the previous slide, these were not just a few hand-selected borrowers. These were actually a significant part of the market. Again, from these data, one can conclude that the private sector is actually doing a better job of serving low and moderate income borrowers than the GSEs. Oops. Lastly, what about the credit box? While it is true that the GSEs have a somewhat wider credit box than portfolio lenders, this wider credit box also encourages risk taking, excessive risk taking. We define excessive risk as having a debt to income ratio of about 43%. 43% was the maximum set in the qualified mortgage rule, which defined a safe mortgage. From this rule, the GSEs were later exempted and the GSEs now can go as high as 50 DTI without compensating factors. Excessive also means lower credit scores. In this instance, I'm showing loans with a credit score below 720. And it also means loans with a high loan to value ratio, in this case here, above 90%. The table compares the shares of GSEs and private portfolio purchase loans in 2016 
with loan amounts between $214,000 and $626,000 that have such risky features. And as you can see, the instances of, the instances of excessive risk taken are far greater in the GSE row than in the private portfolio row. Nevertheless, about two-thirds of GSE borrowers would fit comfortably within the GSE lender's credit box. Many GSE borrowers, as we've seen before, are quite affluent, so they could increase, perhaps could increase their down payment, or they could also opt to purchase a slightly less expensive home. Um, either adjustment or both would increase the percentage of loans that would fit within the, the credit box of the private lenders. So eliminating the GSEs would therefore shift volume to the part of the market where safer, lend safer lending practices prevail today. This would make lending overall safer while also getting taxpayers off the hook. And then final thoughts. Since 2014, portfolio lenders have been origin originating mortgages for about a quarter percentage point below the GSEs. While not every borrower may receive a lower rate, this still offers a favorable starting point to gradually reduce the conforming loan limits and thereby shrink the GSE presence in the market. Furthermore, this will demonstrate that the GSEs can be, co can be eliminated completely without adverse consequences, as the private sector is already well positioned to fill their void. And lastly, with better data available today, we have the opportunity to monitor every step of the plan in near real time, which would allow policymakers to reverse course in the unlikely event that the private sector fails to step in. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Pat. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Uh. I'm going to talk about what will happen to housing and mortgage markets without Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And I want to make five points or five predictions of what will happen when this plan is adopted. The PMBS markets will come back and replace the GSE securities. That's one. Second, lenders will still be able to hedge their pipelines and borrowers will still be able to get rate locks without the GSE TBA markets or very much atrophied TBA markets. Third, mortgage rates won't change very much to the extent there are temporary increases that would, would affect the highest income borrowers, and I even think those will be minimal, if, if at all. Fourth, house prices might be growing a little less rapidly than they have been or than they otherwise would, but that's a good thing. And fifth, housing markets will be more stable with less risk of a crash without the GSEs. So the argument that we need to have government guarantees because otherwise we will have chaos is not true. And I'm going to cause problems here by changing the order of the slides from what you have there, if I can do this correctly. So where do I point this, here you, or I there? I think you point it there. I point it there. There you go, you're forward. Okay, that's where I want to be. All right, so first I'm going to talk about the PMBS market coming back. And over the past decade, there have been many reasons offered for the lack of PMBS uh, coming back. I personally sat through hours and hours of meetings discussing all the problems that the PMBS market has and what needs to be done in order to fix it and how complicated it is and how everybody has their own idiosyncratic ways that they want to fix it just for them and how this is all impossible. Investors in particular, issuers and investors both complained, but investors in particular talked about transparency. They couldn't figure out how bad the loans were. They talked about standardization, uh, faced with stacks of uh, documentation. They couldn't, they couldn't understand the deal by the, in the short amount of time they had before they had to make a decision whether or not to buy some. Uh, servicing, uh, servicing standards and practices uh, varied a lot, and sometimes the servicers uh, 
had an interest in the deal and might, might help one tranche at the expense of others. Uh, enforcement, when things went wrong, uh, investors uh, couldn't get access to files, couldn't talk to fellow investors in order to create some kind of concerted action. All of these are, are, in, are in fact, really problems, uh, but they're particularly problems with the worst loan pack packages backed by the worst loans. Um, subprime, low doc, no doc, and so on and so forth. Uh, but still, there's another problem that is much more important and that we can address much more directly. And we can look at the multifamily market for a hint as to how this is happening. What we have here are four sets of four bars. Each set of bars is an average for four different classifications of loans within uh, that time period. So, for example, in the first, the first bar is over here. For four years, what we can consider a relatively normal period, relatively. Uh, here is the average for four categories of CMBS, office, retail, lodging, and multi. We had the crash. No one wanted to deal with CMBS. They all went way down. By 2013 to 2016, they'd all come back to where they were, or better, except for multifamily. And then last year is, just wanted to separate that out to get the most recent data. Um, everything is still fine except multifamily. Why is multifamily not recovered so much? And here's why. Multifamily, non-agency multifamily is on the bottom in blue. Agency multifamily is in red. There's simply no place for non-agency securities when the agencies are dominating the market and using their incredible advantages to push everybody else aside. The single family story is similar, but in this case, most they can't go back to the 2001-2004 uh, period because what was boosting volume in the single family PMVS area at the time was stuff that nobody wants to do anymore, and with very good reason. It was subprime, it was the low doc, no doc. It was the uh, interest only loans and so on, you know, option arms, all that stuff. Uh, so it's good that that's not coming back. But the PMVS market can thrive if there's a space for them. Fannie and Freddie dominate anything that they have uh, access to because they can outprice everybody, they're subsidized. Uh, right now, there are a lot of loans that are kind of borderline also, but there's, uh, the other issue is the startup costs. For investors and issuers to get back to develop programs in large scale, they need to have confidence that there's going to be supply of, of securities available, loans available and securities available. Rising G fees, we could, we could raise G fees a little bit to eliminate what subsidies still remain. There aren't nearly as many as there used to be. And in the latest budget proposal, it would have a 10 basis point increase in G fees. That would help make the market profitable for the private sector. But to really get movement, we've got to move Fannie and Freddie out of hunks of the market. So that's what we've proposed. That we would start by dropping low loan limits especially for the first for the conforming jumbos. This is people uh, generally with incomes of $150,000 or more. So if we say that borrowers in, that want this size loan have to, will have to go through the private sector, uh, this, is, this is an excellent place to start because they're the ones who can afford it if interest rates for a very short period of time might go up a little bit. We're not sure that they would. Right now, portfolio lenders compete very strongly in anything above uh, the Fannie Freddie loan limits, lowering them in the jumbo-conforming jumbo space, probably have very little effect, but it's the right place to start. As, as we get success, we can keep lowering the loan limits and the PMBS market will now have a chance to take hold again. Um, one, th <clears throat> excuse me. 
Uh, another ad uh, advantage to consider uh, with respect to interest rates is that the private sector has some potential uh, to get more efficiencies into the market than Fannie and Freddie have been able to do. Fannie and Freddie have moved slowly into credit risk transfers. They save money when they do these. It's involving the private sector taking some of the risk that they've been taking. A lot more can be done in this area. Uh, Freddie Mac, for example, has a, a, some deals where the, uh, they don't take any risk in the air in, on the loans at all. All of the risk is uh, shifted off to private insurers before the securities are even made. We can continue uh, to make uh, more inroads so that more of the credit risk is shifted to the private sector and that will save costs. And the private sector certainly will have an incentive to move quickly in that area. Uh, something Norbert's going to talk about is a, a way to get the PMI industry involved, uh, but there are lots of there are other ways to do it in the credit risk transfer uh, area as well. <clears throat> as interest rates might temporarily rise for those sectors that are not part of uh, cover, you know, in the Fannie Freddie space, they'll go down for everybody else because you have a relative scarcity factor. Again, the amounts we're talking about here, I think, are very small. And to be more specific, well, uh, another area that could affect rates is the TBA market. So let me talk about the TBA market. Oops. Uh, there we go. Um, some have argued that rates would, would jump up because without the TBA market, lenders couldn't hedge their, their, uh, their pipelines. Borrowers wouldn't be able to get uh, late rate locks except at exorbitant fees and so forth. Uh, and I, I, I've many times heard Fannie Mae proponents call TBA literally the best thing since sliced bread, uh, that this is essential to, to life as we know it. And actually, life will be possible without it. First... Uh, as GSEs are phased gradually out, th their TBA market might gradually become less liquid, might, might atrophy a bit. But the Ginny May market is still there. And that functions quite well. And we're not talking about getting rid of Ginny Mays. And just as these uh, uh, TBA markets developed naturally, organically, one might say, uh, a PMBS market will develop if there's a need. But we're still, we're still talking about leaving the, the Ginny May securities there, and that might be sufficient. Who knows? And then to put it in perspective with respect to interest rates, what this chart shows, the red line there, is the maximum, I'm sorry, the minimum change in mortgage rates uh, within the course of one year. So for each of the last 30, 47 years, what we have here is, what's the difference between high mortgage rates and low mortgage rates in that year? And since 1978, it's always been at least 40 basis points. The average has been more like 125 basis points. So in context of that, uh, small changes are, are, are normal. And by phasing things in, uh, we would not be able to pick out probably any, any mortgage rate effects, uh, interest rate effects of what we're talking about. Uh, with respect to house prices, um, we might slow demand growth by changing the underwriting standards for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And that would be Strengthening the housing uh, prices would, might lower house prices, prevent or uh, not lower them directly, but change the rate of growth. Right now, supply is way below demand, and it's really pushing up the rate at which house prices are growing, especially in the lowest tiers. It would be good to, it would be good to slow that down, give people more first-time homebuyers a better chance. Uh, finally, if, it, if we do reduce spending by upper income people on bigger houses, this is a good thing for the economy because this is, this is taking uh, 
a narrow, a, a scarce supply of national savings and channeling it into uh, resources that don't increase productivity. It would be much better to channel them into, for example, education or plant and equipment or something like that. And finally, uh, is the issue of stressful times. Don't we need the GSEs to prevent a disaster? Um, I think we need to remember that the GSEs have a great deal of responsibility for the problems that we actually got into, that the crash was, in fact, in important part because of the GSEs, not in spite of them, uh, both directly and indirectly. Directly, the underpriced risk, they kept the private sector out of the relatively safe part of the market. They pushed them into all that was remaining for them, which was the more risky loans. But they, they also cre helped create an aura that you couldn't lose money in this market. There were, everybody was happy to point out that there had never been a price decline at a national level since the depression in house prices. And why was that? Well, it was partly because of Fannie and Freddie. And as uh, Hyman Minsky pointed out uh, some, some decades ago, uh, if, you, if you smooth out all the, the little uh, bubbles, the little aberrations in markets, you can create a false uh, feeling of safety and comfort that encourages people to take more and more risk over time. And that's exactly what happened in the housing markets more and more risk over time. Uh, and then we, we concentrated all that risk very heavily in the DSEs and told them they didn't need to have much capital. So <laughs> their failure and the symbolism of their failure was an important contributor to what happened in 2008. I very much believe that if Fannie and Freddie hadn't failed, in the beginning of September of 2008, what happened in September and October might have been much less or extended over a longer period of time and caused much less uh, cataclysm and, dis and fear, naked fear. Okay, last minute. Finally, uh, a better way to approach stability in the market is through countercyclical capital and risk transfer rules that spread the risk among a wide array of private sector entities, that, uh, and that will provide more powerful protection against the need for government bailouts. Um, Norbert is going to mention something that the mortgage insurers have talked about in uh, uh, counter, counter cyclical policies by having more capital in times like now when prices have been rising very rapidly than before that. Uh, Scott Smith is in the audience here, has done uh, admirable work on exactly how something like this could be implemented, and so have the mortgage insurers. Uh, it, it can be implemented as a regulatory device, as Scott was arguing, or as a private sector device, as, as Norbert will, will discuss. If prices are rising rapidly and you require more capital, then you slow down demand when it uh, is st starting to create a bubble. That's, that's the whole idea. And if a crash does occur, people have more capital. Uh, that's the way to approach this. And time is up. And time is up. On a good note. Thank you. Norbert. Here we are. <laughs> never happens to me, never. Uh, <laughs> uh, the main takeaway uh, from the last crisis should have been that excessive house price inflation and volatility do not come about in spite of all the government support for housing finance. They come about because of that government backing. And we know that throughout history, uh, that this government backing goes hand in hand with lower lending standards. From the 1930s all the way through the 90s, uh, 
private sector lending standards were more restrictive than those in the government sector, and that was primarily FHA and VA. And today, even after having gone through this crash in 2008, uh, we have government agencies and credit easing policies that are promoted by so-called safety and soundness and consumer protection regulators that are serving as the primary source of high-risk mortgage, mortgage credit and once again promoting these inflationary pro-cyclical credit easing policies. So if we gradually eliminate the GSEs, the private housing finance market will remain free of those lower quality subpar subprime loans that did lead to the crisis, and that's why we're saying that this market will remain stable. Now, people tend to ignore this fact, or gloss over it, uh, but prior to the 92 affordable housing goals, Fannie and Freddie only acquired prime mortgages, and that's no longer the case. Again, this is why a smaller GSE footprint, uh, given our history, is likely to result in a largely prime market. Most investors, of course, are going to prefer higher quality securities. Applies here in the case of higher quality loans as well. Some will, of course, still go for higher yielding, lower quality subprime variety. Uh, but there's no reason to expect that a market would be dominated by those types of securities without excessive government backing, just like in any other securities market. Now, this is where everybody sort of freaks out and says, well, there's going to be a disaster. Uh, if we don't have the GSEs, if we don't have the government backing or some explicit guarantee, uh, then nobody's going to get a loan. That, that's that's the, the high-level version. Uh, something like that. Um, but was it really a disaster before the GSE subprime explosion? And the answer is no, it wasn't. And we can look at lots of different pieces of data to see this. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple of these really quickly. We've seen some variation of these this morning. Uh, but if you look at the home ownership rate in the U.S., it was stable for decades before that GSE explosion. In 69, it was just over 64 percent. 92, it was just over 64 percent. And right now, after the crash, just under 64 uh, percent. If we look at the median home price to median income ratio, it exploded in the 90s with the GSE subprime explosion. That's too many explosions, I guess. But um, <laughs> It was stable for decades prior to that. Uh, but what happened after that, of course, is that housing prices rise, started rising faster than income. That's not sustainable. And we have very little to show for it. Uh, if we look at homeowners' equity, what happened? That fell out, right? We had uh, the 90s explosion in subprime exacerbate a downward trend. And what we've done by default here, what we can see is that we have increased low down payment, high risk loans. That's what we increased. We didn't increase ownership. Uh, so how do we keep the private label market mostly free of these low-quality subprime mortgages? Well, we require several market-based enhancements for anything in the private secondary market. And this is really just sort of a basic insurance principle that we're talking about. We want to assess the mortgage quality. We want to include the, the proper costs of those risks in those mortgages it's themselves. And this is the idea. You're going to make people price their risk. That's not really a novel concept. Um, this, of course, would make these loans less attractive to borrowers, and that's the point. So what are these market-based enhancements? Uh, one is private mortgage insurance, PMI, and it is, we're specifically talking about PMI that meets an expanded uh, private mortgage insurance eligibility requirement standard, and that acronym we're going to go with PMIRS. Private Mortgage Insurance Eligibility Requirements. I'll talk more about those in a second. Um, also, we're talking about credit enhancements from other insurers. Uh, these include uh, various different products from diversified property and casualty insurers. We could be talking about bonds or specialty insurance products or different letters of credit. And then we also have other risk-absorbing credit enhancements, such as credit risk transfers. Uh, these are just securities or subordinated tranches. Um, that, uh, that include first loss coverage beyond the limits that are currently being used for the GSE credit risk transfers. All of these have similar risk absorbing capacity to PMI, uh, and they adhere to the risk based relationships under the expanded P Myers proposal. And that's part of the big deal here that we're talking about. That's one of the unique parts of the plan. Uh, 
talking about the P. Meyer standards, these were originally established by the FHFA for the GSEs. They're broadly applicable to all business that's insured by the PMIs. Uh, those, same, those same standards can easily be made applicable for all private securitizations through a qualified residential mortgage standard. The difference with P. Myers is that it's more of a dynamic standard than what we've seen in the past. Uh, it requires mortgage insurers to have assets backing their insurance coverage that's commensurate with the risk of the individual mortgages that they've insured. So it can be thought of as a capital standard. It's based on a loan by loan assessment of risk and it uses items such as LTVs, credit scores, uh, loan purpose, debt to income ratio, etc. Uh, it requires the PMI company to hold additional assets for riskier loans. So a rise in required assets is going to be reflected in higher mortgage rates, making riskier mortgages less attractive to borrowers and providing a counter cyclical buffer. Stuck. Uh, and we also have a couple of additional counter cyclical features that we were talking about. Uh, one, as Pat sort of mentioned, uh, is raising capital requirements on the new loans when market wide house prices rise beyond some normal bounds. That's to provide, specifically, to provide a check against rapid house price inflation and mitigate housing bubbles. The NAIC is actually currently considering just this approach. Uh, insurers have to adjust their required assets uh, for the level of house prices relative to a longer term trend and also for the overall riskiness of the national pool of mortgage originations. That's the idea there. Uh, two additional buffers that we could look at um, would be to change the DTI requirement and to increase the PMI coverage. So right now, P. Meyer standard currently accounts for borrowers DTI ratio only when it exceeds 50%. And we could drop that to 43%, which is like the QM standard. Uh, and then finally, we could expand mortgage insurance coverage so that it would insure for mortgage risk with loans that have LTVs uh, above 60%. So the idea is to expand beyond the traditional 80-20 split. That's pretty much it. And Ed's gonna come back. Thank you very much, Norbert. As tempted as I am to give a lecture right here on counter-cyclical uh, elements in housing finance, uh, it would be better to have Ed come and talk about the FHA. Thanks, Norbert. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that restraint, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> so I, I will talk about FHA reforms and home ownership. Um, I just want to make one observation before I do. Uh, you always hear the housing lobby talk about, you know, the sky is falling. Uh, TBA market disappears and there will be havoc on earth. Uh, this will happen, that will happen. The most recent example of that was with the tax reform bill. You may recall that the NAR uh, commissioned a study and it talked about a 10% decline in house prices. They never made it clear whether it was disinflation, deflation, that was left very murky. It was never clear about which types of houses, which price points might be affected. The headline was, you know, house prices are going to drop and that's going to be uh, a serious problem. Uh, as soon as the bill passed in December, in January, when uh, the first uh, existing home sales were released, uh, the head of research for the NAR at the, in the uh, uh, press release says, oh, the effect of the tax bill is going to be minimal. It's really, we can't even probably measure it. Uh, so during the run-up, catastrophe, sky's falling, pa the bill passes, nothing happens. That has happened time and time again when Congress, in the few occasions where they've done it, has actually done something against the will of the housing lobby. So I'm going to uh, talk about FHA and other uh, things related to home ownership. So FHA needs to change its uh, current approach. Right now, FHA is the pro-cyclical force in the housing market. It is the point of the spear in terms of the marginal buyer. It's providing the loosest credit, the highest amount of leverage to uh, first-time buyers. 80% of FHA's business goes to first-time buyers. Um, it's being, there's competition with uh, Fannie and Freddie for that, but FHA leads the role. 
those buyers set the price for the entire price point in that part of the market that they're in. If FHA has buyers in the $150,000 price point in the neighborhood, everyone in that neighborhood who's buying in that rough price point is going to pay higher prices because of FHA. Likewise, at $250,000, same thing. FHA's loan limits are quite uh, high as a result of the financial crisis. They haven't particularly been lowered all that much. So to, present, to prevent FHA from poaching large portions of Fannie and Freddie's business, and we know that can happen, because during the um, premium reduction that occurred in early 2015, FHA took 40% of rural housing's business and took large chunks of Fannie's business and lesser chunks of Freddie's business. So we know that there's a porous membrane going back and forth, and I call it government mortgage with five brands, just like General Motors has a lot of brands. Well, government mortgage has all these brands, and that business moves back and forth depending on the best execution. So if... Uh, Fannie and Freddie are brought down in terms of what they can do, then FHA will move into that uh, sector. So to prevent that, uh, the FHA footprint would need to be reduced as the GSE footprint is reduced in terms of loan limits and, and things of that nature. They don't do second homes. They don't do investors, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, secondly, FHA should focus on sustainable and wealth-building home purchases by low- and moderate-income families. They don't currently focus on that. They do focus on first-time buyers, but not uh, sustainable wealth building for low- and moderate-income home buyers. They should be limited to buyers of existing homes with incomes of less than three times the median uh, area income and new homes less than four times. This would target them to an area that they'd actually then be focused uh, appropriately. They should incent the supply increase in economical new homes. I mentioned earlier that Congress historically has done virtually nothing in an effort to promote additional supply, what the easy thing for the Congress to do is promote more demand, um, but not do anything about supply. So it could put limits on new construction uh, that are limited to a floor area of, let's say, under 1,800 square feet for a new home. That would incent builders to build uh, smaller new homes and add to that supply, which is desperately needed. It could provide a consumer disclosure of a loan's likelihood to default under stress conditions. If we can provide a notice on a refrigerator of how much energy it's going to be using, we certainly could be providing a notice to consumers that the loan they're getting back in 2006, 2007, 2008 had a 47% chance of default under stress. That is not disclosed to consumers today. Let's do that. We could also ensure that FHA's underwriting standards do not result in higher concentrations of delinquencies and claims in low and moderate income neighborhoods. Let's not disadvantage the low and moderate income buyers even more through policies that drive up prices and drive up volatility. And uh, do not and, and have policies that don't promote higher real, price, real home prices during extended periods of a seller's market. Again, have FHA, instead of being pro-cyclical during the seller's market, have it be counter-cyclical. FHA always says it wants to be um, counter-cyclical during a bust. Well, then if you want to be counter-cyclical during a bust, you have to be counter-cyclical during the boom. But today, FHA has been counter-cyclical during the bust and pro-cyclical during the boom. That's a recipe for the disaster which is currently uh, developing. Next, FHA could take additional steps. Uh, one is revert to historical uh, techniques for mortgagee risk sharing. When FHA started in the 30s, there were many, many different provisions it had. It always covered 100% uh, with a claim, but it had all kinds of things built in that actually shared a substantial portion of the risk. It might have been 15 or 20%, but it was real money and kept the uh, mortgage, uh, uh, mortgagees from taking on excessive risk. Today, there's no such stop on that, and that's one of the reasons why virtually all of FHA's business is currently done by non-bank um, uh, institutions, uh, the, the mortgage bankers that aren't affiliated with banks. It's not the only reason. There are many reasons, but that's one of them. Uh, they could set a capital plan uh, during boom conditions. Uh, Congress's the 2% that's set by statute is a minimum. It doesn't say anything about a maximum. And historically, that fund has been allowed to accumulate, but the housing lobby views the 2% as both a minimum and a maximum. Uh, of course, it's in their interest to look at it that way. 
Um, and so they could have a capital requirement target uh, for boom conditions, which we're certainly in today. For 30-year loans, they could crowd out the 30-year loan during boom times. Uh, they could implement ability to repay um, and ratios that limit to 43% unless the residual income test is used, which the VA has been using for 60 or 70 years uh, and FHA used to use and then abandoned decades ago. They could limit the maximum seller concession to 3%. Currently, they go up to 6%. This is another thing that during the seller's market helps just fuel the increases in home prices, and again, for the whole market. Uh, adopt mortgage insurance pricing and underwriting changes that, again, crowd in the 20-year loan, crowding out the 30-year loan, um, and so you end up with a, that's a form of countercyclical uh, approach and builds more equity buildup during the time of this house price boom that we're going on, we're going through. I believe the HUD secretary has the authority to implement all of these changes, and therefore these could be done administratively. I'd like to finish up uh, on FHA by shifting to reliable wealth building as a central focus of federal home ownership policy. We've had an affordable housing policy. It has not led to reliable uh, health, wealth building and has not led to stability. We need to get back and try to get to those two points. So we suggest a low-income, first-time buyer tax credit known as Lift Home. And it's a transparent, targeted, on-budget, upfront tax credit, and that would be more effective than today's systems based on high-risk lending to marginal buyers with opaque cross-subsidies that benefit largely the housing lobby, not the uh, first-time home buyer. Over 10 years, we estimate that some 4 million first-time low-income home buyers we placed on a path to wealth building uh, with a 50% reduction in default risk. They'd also be positioned, well-positioned, for future home buying without FHA or without high uh, LTV loans when they buy their next loan or next, next home. It would free up, we estimate, about 1.2 million low-income rentals. Anyone who's moving uh, out of a rental into a home, by definition, they're low income because that's what the program requires, and that would free up rentals. We assume that about 40 percent of the, uh, or about 30 percent of the 4 million would uh, be moving out of rentals, uh, and therefore that would be an increase in supply. Again, a very important point, you have to increase supply. That's an increase in supply at no cost, and that's more units over 10 years than the low-income housing tax credit would provide over 10 years at a cost of $9 billion a year for low-income housing tax credits. So for free, you get this increase in supply uh, resulting from this low-income uh, first-time home buyer tax credit for multi, uh, uh, on these rental units. To incent a further increase in economical new homes, you could limit the size on eligible newly constructed homes to 1,800 square feet, again, promote a supply response from the home builders. You, could, you would, should limit this to loans not guaranteed by government agencies because they're already getting manifold subsidies, uh, and this would allow the private sector to provide this. You could limit the loans to less than or equal to 20 years, and it's a one-time refundable credit used to buy down the interest rate for at least five years up front. Uh, and the cost is estimated at about uh, $4 billion a year. Uh, that uh, could be funded um, through a pay-for from either eliminating the mortgage interest deduction on second homes, which itself would have another supply response and a, at a savings of about $2 billion a year, or a, and a, identifying and repurposing about $2 billion in annual HUD funding, all of which could then be used to provide the benefits that I just described. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Steve. Thanks, Alex. Um, my presentation will cover two issues. The first is the potential for uh, cost savings to the U.S. Treasury uh, that would result from reduced uh, interest costs on Treasury securities. The second is the ability of the private market to step up during the transition period away from the GSEs. I'll start with the question of cost savings. 
So because GSE MBS has an effective government guarantee, it competes in the debt market with treasury securities that of course have an explicit guarantee. And this competition um, raises the interest rates that the treasury has to pay to place its debt. Eliminating the GSE competition would uh, reduce those interest rates. The question is by how much? I mean, this is a question that has been of long-standing interest, but we get a unique window which we exploit into quantitatively what this might involve because of the Fed's quantitative easing program. And the QE program uh, was the Fed's explicit attempt to lower long-term interest rates by removing the supply of treasury and agent secur securities that had to be placed in the market. So the basics of QE, um, I know it's very familiar, but let me just set the stage. Um, from the end of 2008 to uh, 2014, the Fed acquired about uh, a little more than $3.5 trillion of Treasury Securities and Agency MBS. The Agency MBS consisted of both GSE MBS and, and GINIs. Um, the consensus view from a lot of studies um, is that QE did reduce long-term interest rates, but there's still an ongoing debate um, about how much. I mean, even in recent days, there have been papers coming out about the size of this effect. So I, I don't want to make this seem as though this is a slam dunk for the exact numbers that I'm going to be presenting, but qualitatively, um, there is a strong evidence base for QE having reduced long-term interest rates. In terms of the magnitude of the effect that we're going to be using in this presentation, um, I'm going to use the rule of thumb from John Williams, um, who is the president of the San Francisco Fed, based on his review of the existing literature. And that, that rule of thumb is that a, a purchase of $600 billion, um, which was the size of the QE2 program, lowered the 10-year Treasury rate between 15 and 25 basis points. Okay, so now let's use that starting point to try to get at what the elimination of GSE MBS might mean for Treasury rates. So there's about $5, billion, $5 trillion of GSE MBS outstanding today, which is roughly eight times the size of the QE2 program. So if we just naively scale up the Williams rule of thumb by a factor of eight, we'd get um, a drop in the 10-year Treasury rate of 120 to 200 basis points. That's only a starting point. That is way, way above what would actually happen in any plausible circumstance. And so we scale down this rule of thumb for three reasons that, redu that results in a scaling down by a factor of six. So very, very large scaling down. The first is that QE did more than just eliminate supply of long-term securities. It also signaled to the market the Fed's intent for monetary policy implemented through the federal funds rate. And there have been studies on this signaling effect. Um, the one that I think is um, you know, the most compelling is, is, was research done at the San Francisco Fed that found about half of the uh, effect on long-term rates really came through signaling. So based on that, we take a haircut of 50% just for that factor off of the Williams rule of thumb. The second is that the Williams rule of thumb refers to 10-year Treasury debt. Well, most Treasury securities Mature, have maturities that are much shorter than 10 years. So there is research at the Federal Reserve Board um, that looked at the effects of QE across the maturity spectrum, um, finding, no, not surprisingly, that at the short end of the curve, the effects were very small. So when we use the actual maturity structure of the Treasury debt combined with those estimates, we have another haircut that um, takes the uh, size of the effect down by 50%. So already we're down by a factor of four. And the final uh, haircut is, is because the QE purchases um, were of both treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. But if we eliminate the GSEs, we're just getting rid of mortgage-backed securities. If treasuries and MBS, agency MBS, were perfect substitutes, this wouldn't matter uh, because it would just be different pieces of paper that people are equally willing to hold. But they're probably not perfect substitutes. Um, there are different... Um, effects on Treasury and MBS returns when interest rates generally move that um, cause them not to be perfect substitutes. So again, we take another haircut, this time um, reducing uh, the effect by about a third. So when you take those three haircuts together, 
you're down by a factor of six. So when we apply that factor of six haircut to 120 to 200 basis points, we end up with a reduction in overall treasury borrowing costs of about 20 to 33 basis points, which given the size of the treasury's outstanding debt corresponds to a basis a dollar saving of about 17 to 29 uh, billion dollars per year. Now this would also be a savings for um, Ginny May because Ginny May MBS also has an explicit federal guarantee. It would continue to exist. And so the same reductions in rates for treasury securities would apply to Ginny's, which would then feed through to have some beneficial effect on rates for FHA and VA loans. Now importantly, all the numbers I've just mentioned, these are fully phased in effects after all GSE MBS is gone. That's going to be under our plan more than a decade from now. So the nearer term effects would be considerably smaller, but this is what they would eventually build to. Um, that point about um, the decline in GSE MBS brings me to my second topic, which is that decline would be very gradual under our plan, which is important for thinking about the ability of the private sector to backfill. So. Um, the, the key ar arithmetic really is that um, in all cases, whether it's GSE, MBS, or anything else, the stock of something changes a lot more slowly than changes to the flow. Um, and you know, you can think about that just in terms of a bathtub example. If you have a bathtub that's already half full of water and you've got the tap open, and then you close the tap, well, the flow is dropped by 100%, but the water's still in the bathtub and it drains out slowly. Um, because um, you know, there's a large mass that needs to move. So that's basically the same thing in terms of our estimates of what happens to GSE MBS outstanding versus GSE new issuance. And the little table here shows that new issuance over the, the phase-in period that we talk about in our proposal of seven years would reduce new issuance over this period by... Did you get a table on the slide? Or? I'm sorry, I haven't been moving this. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm so engaged, I'm not moving the slides. <laughs> and you thanks. can see them up here. So. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the new issuance would drop by more than three quarters, but the outstandings would drop by less than 40%, from roughly $5 trillion to $3.1 trillion. So even at the end of 2024, there would be more than $3 trillion of GSE MBS outstanding under our proposal. So if you look back historically, and try to scale this amount that would be remaining by the size of the entire um, U.S. debt markets, um, we'd be back to a situation that is roughly comparable to what we had in terms of the GSE footprint in the early 1990s. So roughly back to what um, would be the years just preceding the explosion, uh, the GSE explosion that Norbert referred to. Um, so, you know, it's not as if over even seven years the GSEs are going to disappear. We're just returning to an earlier period when we had a well-functioning uh, mortgage market. And in the very early years, the first three years of our proposal, which are shown in the bottom table, the decline in GSE outstanding, um, GSE MBS outstanding would be a, a little under $100 billion in the first year, 165 in the second. 310 in the third. In terms of that share, those numbers as a share of the outstanding five trillion, they're very, very small. 2% in the first year, 3%, then 6%. The other, um, another perspective for gauging um, how much um, adjustment this would require is just putting those numbers in the context of the size of the whole U.S. fixed income market. Now for this scaling comparison, I'm going to take treasuries out completely so that we're really focusing on debt that has some default risk that we can think of as a closer substitute for um, private sector MBS uh, or private sector holdings of whole loans. So. Based on numbers from SIFMA, from the Federal Reserve Board, and from the Treasury Department, our estimate is that there's about $45 trillion today of total fixed income uh, debt, securities plus loans, uh, if we just even put Treasuries to the side. About $25 trillion of that is securities, about another $20 trillion, a little less, is whole loans and trade credit for about $45 trillion. About 
40 trillion of that is held by private sector agents. So if we take the US government and foreign government holdings of that debt out of the picture, we have about $40 trillion of debt that has some default risk held by the private sector. So now if we come back to the numbers that we were talking about on the last slide of how much decline there would be in GSE MBS in the first three years, $95 billion, $165 billion, $310 billion, and slot that into a $40 trillion market, we're talking about very, very small shares. And the shares are actually shown in the table at the bottom of the page. You know, fractions of 1%. One minute. Good, thanks. I, I'm on time. So let me, uh, this is my last slide, and let me conclude here. Um, we've been talking about the holdings of the, of the debt, but not about the capital that would need to back um, the holdings of that debt. So our estimate is that in today's market, there's roughly $250 billion of private equity that backs single-family mortgages through mortgage-backed securities and, and whole loans. Um, and the depositories hold about two-thirds of that. They're well capitalized. They provide a very stable base for us to then build private capital holdings. The rest comes from private mortgage insurers, REITs, hedge funds, other institutional investors. So where, would, where do we expect the additional capital to come from? For the most part, we think it will come from a revived private mortgage-backed securities market. And you know, Pat gave a great talk about um, why it is that we haven't seen that revival yet. And it, it's supported by conversations that we've had with a number of market participants who basically say, look, today there's just not enough flow. There's too much, uh, the GSEs and the uh, banks are really just gobbling up all the prime product. So why are we going to put much effort into um, all of these, the work that Pat mentioned that would need to be done to lay the groundwork for this market when we're just picking up nickels off the ground? We can finally pick up you know, $10 bills, $50 bills, $100 bills. Yeah, then there's going to be a lot more interest in doing that. So the key is to have a forcing event that creates a channel for more of that product to make its way to the private sector. And finally, um, some of the capital will come from the private mortgage insurance industry. We've also had conversations with participants in that industry. And without committing to any specific increase in their support for um, the mortgage market, they have indicated that they would ramp up in response to a proposal like ours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Having heard a lot of elements of this uh, program, we're now going to come to the con summary and conclusion. Peter. Okay, thank you. Now let's hope the system works. Yes, okay. <laughs> you can all see that. We're golden. Um, the power of the presentation you have just heard from all of my colleagues is the data. Um, that's why we are confident that this pro proposal will actually succeed. All the data and the charts are in the paper that we are distributing. So you can take that with you, you can read it through, you can get the details, but it should affect, that data should affect the way the debate goes forward about the future of the GSEs. Um, the slide that you see now um, illustrates the plan. I told you at the beginning that we were going to give you the more details about the plan, and we've given you some summaries. But this is a chart that kind of shows how it would work. And we haven't carried the numbers all the way out to the end, but we've carried them through 2024, as Steve said. And you saw that in Ed's discussion, only about 10% of all the GSE's business is directed at helping people who may actually need government help to buy their first home. So we would start by gradually eliminating all GSE activities that don't help these families. This means we would eliminate GSE activities for all other groups of borrowers, such as those who are refinancing. We believe all the items we are eliminating could easily be handled by the private sector, and government support is ultimately unnecessary. So you can do this in any order. This is the order we decided to put things in, but you could 
change it around and do it differently if that's what any administration that is putting this into place chooses to do. But in 2019, we would start by eliminating what are called the high cost conforming loan limits. Uh, that's about $680,000 uh, now in 2018. These are applicable in areas of the country, California, New York, and elsewhere, where the housing costs are very high. We don't think people who are able to buy million dollar homes need or should have government help, nor should the taxpayers take the risk of these well-to-do borrowers. In 2020, we would make ineligible for the GSEs all non-owner occupied homes, they're often called investor homes, and all second homes. Again, no reason for the taxpayers to take these risks for people who are buying investor homes or second homes. In 2021, we would make ineligible all cash out financing, where the borrower takes cash out while refinancing a mortgage. This makes the mortgage riskier, as everybody knows, and there is no reason for the taxpayers to take this risk either. Finally, in 2022, we would begin to reduce the, what are called the standard conforming loan limits, which are about $450,000 in 2018. And we do that by 20% each year through 2024. As you can see on the chart, by the end of 2024, the total liabilities of the GSEs would be a little over $3 trillion, down from $5 trillion in 2018. And their new business volume will have been reduced by 77%. That's the end of our presentation. Uh, it's now time for questions, so I'll turn it over to Alex, and I guess all of us will come up and uh, well, you're get You're already up, that. so you just have to come sideways. Well, I'm afraid and to walk <laughs> across this gap. <laughs> may, I, uh, may I ask the panel? Mind the gap. Yeah, mind the gap. <laughs> may I ask okay. the panel to come up uh, to the dais, and then we'll start the questions. We're going to start the question period, but we're going to have a housekeeping announcement from Ed first as soon as everybody's settled up here. And let me thank you all again for being uh, with us for this, I think, very uh, provocative uh, and interesting plan, uh, which could happen. Ed. First, I've, I've inherited a very nice watch. Thank you, Alex. Oh, th <laughs> this is much nicer than what I have. Well, I'm going to take that and <laughs> pass on mine. <laughs> so the housekeeping announcement, once again, uh, we already have some questions from uh, live streamers, but a uh, reminder, uh, you may submit your uh, questions if you're live streaming by going to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, slido.com. The event code is AEI event, and you can submit your questions there for consideration. Of course, the live audience uh, will be uh, raising their hand and uh, wait for the mic to come to it, but Alex will uh, describe all of that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ed, and ladies and gentlemen. We are coming to our uh, question period, and I, I especially thank you for my watch, Pat, because I'm going to tell you in a minute what I'll be using it for during this question period. Uh, may I remind you for our questions, please wait uh, till the microphone gets to you. Uh, when it gets to you, uh, tell us your name and your affiliation and state your question. Now, uh, if when the microphone is in your hand, you feel a sudden urge to give a lecture as, a, <laughs> as opposed to asking a question, then I will look at this watch, which Pat nicely gave me, and you will get one minute maximum, at which point uh, I also need to recover my glass from you. So this is Thank the you. May I have your name. pen, though? <laughs> no. <laughs> At that point, I will remind you, if you get there, which I assume no one will, uh, that it's it's time to ask your question. So the the floor uh, is open, and uh, I have a first question in the back, and then we'll come over to you here, and then we'll come to you. One, two, three. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you, Alex Burt Ely, a banking consultant uh, here in town. Uh, first of all, very impressive uh, presentation, and um, you know, strikes me it has uh, uh, it's very feasible. But my question is this: in all of your discussions of what would replace what exists today, I didn't hear a single reference to covered bonds. Covered bond financing has been used for mortgage financing in lots of countries for lots of years. Uh, it's becoming uh, more popular, more widely used up, up to the north in Canada. Uh, why do we not hear any consideration of covered bonds as one uh, source of financing for home mortgages in this brave new world of housing finance? Thank you. Anybody want to take up covered bonds, Pat? Uh, yeah. And I have uh, a second question over here. There's been a lot of interest in that for several years, and uh, one of the things holding it back, I believe, is that we, we ha already have a covered bond system, uh, but it re revolves around the home loan bank system. It kind of dominates the kind of system that they have in Europe. A bank can hold the loans in portfolio and borrow the money from home loan banks. I'm pointing at Alex because he used to be associated with one of them. Uh, and, and that's a cheaper alternative, a, a more because they're, they're another GSE and they can borrow at preferential rates that are probably better than what a, you know, a JP Morgan could do. But we have a system right now that JP Morgan could do it. And if that turned out to be more cost effective, a better execution methodology, sure, that'd be great. And we did broadly lump it into other credit enhancements. I mean, it was in there. I did say the word bonds. I didn't go into any detail, but it was in there. Thank you. I have a second question. Oh, where was my hand? I had a, a hand. Oh, right here. I had a hand. Thank you. Two questions. I might hit the one minute limit then, but um, maybe I get two because I have two questions. But, uh, no, you don't get two minutes, but you so tell us your name and your affiliation. Paul Callum from the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, uh, but the questions that were um, first question is, I'm going to push back a little on the, the idea that the, um, the private sector would be more stable. Um, if you talk to, uh, you know, it's kind of well known that the GSEs argued they were dragged into this race to the bottom by the private sector. So, <laughs> so that my one question is how you respond to that. And um, secondly, the private sector, you know, this distinction between GSE, FHA versus private sector is a little artificial because, as you know, the private sector the banking sector is heavily regulated and the rest of the private sector still has CFPB and other forms of regulation. So would part two of your plan address how to, how to you know, kind of get the balance between regulation in this, and private versus in this so-called private sector? Okay, thanks. Two good questions. Uh, let's take the first question first on how do we respond to the GSE's uh, apology for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, both Peter and I have written and, and researched extensively on this. Uh, I was chief credit officer at Fannie Mae up until uh, the late uh, uh, 1980s. I can state uh, how this happened from first knowledge. Uh, we've done a lot of research on it since. Um, the Fannie and Freddie led the way after the affordable housing goals. It actually started a little bit before that. Uh, under Jim Johnson as CEO of, of Fannie, uh, but it really began in earnest. Uh, and as uh, was described earlier, the capital levels for Fannie and Freddie were so low, they were able to take all the low-hanging fruit. Um, when I was chief credit officer, if you'd said, oh, I want you to go into competition with the subprime market or either private subprime or government subprime, which was FHA at the time, um, I would have said, are you crazy? Um, those are distinct markets. We don't, you know, we don't compete in those markets. It's prime. We mentioned that. So that all began, that slippery slope began in the early 90s, and the private sector was dragged along kicking and screaming. I mean, they, they were left with what was left, and they had to keep moving out as Fannie and Freddie uh, moved out. We've done a lot of research on that. I would just say that, again, I went back to the literally the 1930s, 1920s, and the private sector, well, the government wasn't involved up until 1934. So from 1934 on, the private sector was always within uh, lower than where the government was, with the one exception of 2004 to 2006, um, and in terms of quantity and, and quality. Uh, and that was led by this errant affordable housing policy that started in earnest in 1992. 
Other uh, comments on the on question one? Yeah, I, the private sector uh, was pushed into the most dubious parts of the market because that's all it was left. Fannie and Freddie took the rest. Um, the private sector, it's not the, uh, the the GSEs helped foster the environment that made people believe that this would actually be a safe thing to do. Uh, they, you know, you can go back to the Russian debt crisis when uh, uh, there was a brief disturbance. They jumped right in, and they didn't just stabilize the market. They pushed interest rates way, mortgage rates way down. Uh, it actually expanded it. Uh, you know, they, they created the aura that anything happens, we will overcompensate to make sure you're protected. And I think that helped uh, create the environment. Uh, Fannie and Freddie, you know, getting rid of Fannie and Freddie uh, gets rid of their, what they do in the market. Uh, the private sector may still make mistakes from time to time. Certainly, uh, you know, the CDO squared and all that stuff, Philadelphia Fed has, has done some fine research on how critical that was to the whole thing. You know, that may, you know, crazy things like that may happen again. All we're saying is it'd be safer, less, more stable than uh, with them. Uh, Steve. Yeah, maybe just <clears throat> one other comment on Paul's question, which is a good question. Um, and there has been a ton of uh, academic research on, on exactly this question, much of which finds that you don't see compelling evidence in terms of a causal um, uh, push from the GSEs. But I think the narrative that Ed and Pat were laying out makes it very difficult in an event study type of setting to find the GSE fingerprints because what we're talking about is an environment that um, made risk taking relatively low cost that goes back for more than a decade before we actually get to the conflagration. So that narrative is hard to put into a standard event study kind of analysis. So I think the story that we're telling is that the GSEs lit the match, but then other people came along and blew on the fire. And by the time the fire was really going, you couldn't really tell who lit the match in the first place from the types of studies that are often done. Peter. <laughs> I'd like to add a little bit to that because it's a correct analysis in my view, but there's something else going on, and that is when the GSE started to com uh, comply with the affordable housing goals, the first thing they did was to reduce underwriting, uh, to not only reduce underwriting standards, but particularly down payments, which created much more leverage. And you can see it in the data as the, the prices began to rise. What happened then in the market was that to lenders, it looked less like these loans were risky. First of all, there were very few defaults uh, because as prices rise, people don't default, they can refinance. And so the lenders said, well, there, gee, there are much better mortgages out here. That is, they're richer mortgages with higher interest rates, but there are very few defaults, so there's not much of a risk. And anyway, next year, the house will be worth 10% more. So I'm really not taking much of a risk. So this whole thing builds on itself. Um, what you have to prevent is that happening in the first place, and the way to do that is what Norbert talked about, that is some kind of counter-cyclical system, P. Myers or otherwise, to keep that under control and make sure that as mortgages get riskier, they get more expensive to make. Thanks for your very provocative question. Uh, I'll only add we mustn't forget the price effect, which was highlighted by the panel. Fannie and Freddie were inflating all, not just subprime prices, all house prices in the entire economy, setting up, of course, the massive fall. I've, I've, oh, we're going to come to you, but we have a second question. The question, I think, was, are banks really in the private sector? Is that a fair way to put it? And so when we count on the banks, uh, can we count them as private sector? Anybody want to take that? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and that, that may partly account for um, I'm gonna. the uh, very nice pricing on jumbo loans currently. Mm -hmm. uh, banks have access uh, to deposit insurance, and uh, uh, that enables them to do some, uh, some things they maybe otherwise wouldn't do. I, I think it's important not to depend entirely on banks in a new system. And uh, Norbert and I, in our presentations, tried to focus on 
private sort and, and also uh, Steve uh, mentioning sources of equity. We need to get sources of equity, not just in the banking system. To make a safer, more stable system, we want relatively non-leveraged providers of equity uh, so that uh, if there is a crash, it's much less damaging to the system as a whole. All right, I'm going to take a question right here, please. Uh, then we're going to check Ed to see what's happening uh, with our friends uh, via computer, and, and then I'll come back, uh, Josh, to you. And Thank you. Hear. Okay, uh, here. Yes, please. It's Michael Berenson from the Morgan Lewis Law Firm. To, to what extent are there legal or other barriers to implementing the plan? Um, and... And if there aren't any, why hasn't it been implemented sooner, before now? All right, well, Peter, me, I think that's me, for you. Yeah, I think I'll deal with that. Um, the two, the two uh, things in Dodd-Frank that I think would be troublesome here is QM, qualified mortgage, and the qualified residential mortgage. We can leave the qualified mortgage aside for a moment because that's the um, ability to repay issue. But the question that um, is really interesting here is the qualified residential mortgage, which was an attempt in Dodd-Frank to create something that was a high-quality mortgage and was the only kind of mortgage that could be securitized in the private market. That was an interesting idea. But the agencies that were given the responsibility of implementing that could not agree. And in the end, what they did with a little bit of pressure, as we understand from the White House, they made the qualifying residential mortgage the same as the qualified mortgage, which is not a very good standard at all. Now, in our plan, we would assume that the agencies could get together again, and in the Trump administration, they would agree on a qualified residential mortgage that would be a bulletproof or very high quality mortgage for mortgage securitization. That would do a little bit of what Norbert was talking about, making the mortgages better quality, but that would be the legal way that our plan would be implemented. But Peter, could I, if I follow up on behalf of the questioner here a little bit? What legal things are standing in the way of administratively taking all of the steps that you laid out so succinctly? Anything? Uh, something so was Two quick uh, answers to both the first and second part of your question. First of all, we, the uh, regulator uh, wears two hats, FHFA director, one as regulator, safety and so-called safety and soundness regulator, but secondly as conservator. And as conservator, he has much broader powers, uh, immensely broader powers than as regulator, and therefore can do these things as conservator, number one. Number two, we were going down this road to your second part of the question uh, with the prior uh, acting director, Ed DeMarco. Uh, he was limiting multifamily tremendously. He was raising, uh, under statutory guidance from Congress, raising G fees and had planned on raising them further, and that was suspended. He was doing other things to uh, reduce the footprint of Fannie and Freddie, and those things then were reversed once um, he was replaced by the current director, uh, and that, so then we got back into high LTV lending, higher debt ratios, all of the things that we're saying are bad that the government tends to do are now coming back under the guise of the regulator. Now, I just add, uh, it, there's, there's something nice about doing uh, a major change in the federal government's role in the housing market by legislation, and, and as someone who used to work on the Hill, you know, I, when I was working there, I would certainly have said that I thought that's the right way to do it. That's what should be done. But it's been nine and a half years. <laughs> it's it's time to consider, reconsider how to how to do this. It, doing this wouldn't be perfect. Uh, you, you could, you know, we could probably agree on something that we would think would be even better doing it legislatively. But this is the only game in town. Peter, anything else? Uh, I wasn't going to add anything to that, but it is true that uh, it doesn't seem to me, from as an observer of what goes on in the Hill, that there is any way to get legislation through uh, without an agreement between people who generally are unhappy about the government being involved in this business at all, don't see any purpose in it, 
and the people who insist that the government has to be involved for the purpose of providing affordable housing. We think we can make the case that it would be better for the people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of affordable housing not to have a system in which prices are forced up every year by high leverage, which is what they think is the way to achieve affordable housing. It also happens to be, maybe not coincidentally, um, something that uh, uh, helps the realtors and the home builders. But in any event, the people who want affordable housing believe that they have to make mortgages uh, very easy to get, very low quality in terms of underwriting in order to help um, low and moderate income people buy homes. And I think we can make the case that those families would be better off uh, without a government program because in our economy, there is a product for everyone who wants to buy it. And if that means that it has to be 1,800 square feet um, and, and in an area where it's a little further away from work, all of those things are possible, uh, but the homes will be built if there is a demand. Okay, thanks. Now I want to check uh, with Ed yes. and questions from those who are not physically here but who are with us nonetheless. Enthusiastic question, questioners. Uh, before I do that, uh, I know the next uh, uh, live question is uh, coming from Josh Rosner, and not only was Peter Wallison in 1998 in the New York Times article pressing about the role that Fannie and Freddie would play, but Josh wrote a very influential paper uh, in 2000 or 2001 entitled um, a, uh, a home buyer without down payment is just a renter with a mortgage. And he fingered many, th three or four things, most of which revolved around Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Again, this was in the early days when people weren't, this wasn't even on people's radar screen by and large. So I just add that to. So the first question is, and I, I think I could take two here. Treasury, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin has already said he will not eliminate the GSEs. So what is the goal of this event? And that's from Alex Rodriguez. <laughs> Yes, that's for me. <laughs> um, well, the goal of this event is to persuade someone who outranks the Treasury, of the sec uh, Treasury Secretary um, that he can achieve something very important and historic without having to go through legislation. I won't mention the name. In fact, I got it wrong the first time. <laughs> but, but in any event, it can be done if people look at the data and look at what this would achieve for the economy as a whole and for all prospective home buyers. So whatever Secretary Mnuchin is interested in here, um, I'm sure it's the welfare of the economy as he sees it, but uh, from our perspective, uh, things would be a lot better if um, he receives um, some inducement from higher up to look at it a different way. Thank you, Any, anybody else on that one? Okay, Ed. So um, I would just add that um, back if you, a year ago, if you had said that the uh, uh, mortgage interest deduction would be substantially uh, reduced and emasculated through legislative action, uh, you probably could have gotten 50 to 1 odds that that was not going to happen. And yet uh, it did happen in December. So again, uh, you have to put out the right uh, uh, proposals, which we believe this is the correct approach, and then hope that sounder minds are listening and make those decisions uh, who might outrank the Treasury Secretary. Before you read your next question, I want to um, just add something to that, which is one of my favorite uh, sayings. Uh, this one's from a physicist. Uh, Many things which were previously considered impossible nevertheless came to pass. It is very true. Uh, uh, when I was uh, a young trainee in the bank, I remember being, it being explained to me that Regulation Q, some of you may remember what Regulation Q was, the, the setting of interest rates by the Fed was so fixed a part of the American financial system that it was permanent and it would never go away. Of course, it did go away. Ed. And another physicist, Albert Einstein, said, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, that's the definition of insanity, and I would call that's what our affordable housing policy has been. So the next question is from Tom LaMalfa. 
and um, it's uh, for Peter. Peter, why did you dissent from the FCIC's final report? <laughs> Tom knows the answer to that. Let's go on. Um, the, uh, just, it, briefly, um, I didn't believe that the uh, Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission was genuinely attempting to get to the bottom of what actually caused the financial crisis. I think, unfortunately, they came in with the idea that they would support the idea for strong legislation in Congress, and they succeeded in doing that by making the case that the reason for the financial crisis was insufficient regulation of the financial system. Okay, we're gonna go back to our audience right here, please. All that free PR, uh, yeah, exactly. Josh, I, I, think it's well, I think it's well deserved. Thank you very much. So I've got two you, questions. You need to introduce yourself, please. Josh Rosner, Graham Fisher and Company. Thank two you. quick questions. I'm gonna add a third. Uh, who's got that top apartment up there? Because that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's Peter. We, that was Andrew Mellon. We, knew, we know who did have it. Yeah, Andrew, Mellon. Have it. Andrew Mellon. Andrew Mellon. Mellon right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so um, two questions. The first is just to be clear. It doesn't seem like you have a particular counter-cyclical buffer on the downside. So when housing markets weaken, you're accepting that there is going to be less lending, and that's just part of the economic cycle, and that's acceptable. Oh, well, I, Let, um, why don't, we why, why don't you go that? through your three questions quickly? Well, and the first we'll I already did. Yeah. That was the second. Oh, oh I see. Okay, yeah. good. So the, third, the third is there's you know, several trillion dollars on bank balance sheets, and the banks could, in fact, compete rather than sell to the enterprises and hold in portfolio. But the reality is the Fed's payment uh, uh, interest on reserves, the tax policies, and Basel III create significant disincentives for banks to hold. So doesn't that end up having a significant play and in this discussion, and why would that change just by the elimination of the GSEs? Or would it lead to further liquidity constraints? Okay, thanks. Let's take question one, counter-cyclical on the downside. Uh, on question one, uh, if uh, regulators implement or if mortgage insurers implement uh, a counter-cyclical capital approach, which makes a lot of sense, it's certainly something that uh, all holders of mortgage risk should consider doing implementing for the, their own benefit, for their own internal capital models, uh, then they will feel more comfortable about lending when house prices are cyclically low rather than cyclically high. Except, hold on. Hang on. Just, hey, hey, no. uh, that's a static snapshot, but in reality, where they don't Josh, the bottom. excuse me, excuse me. Mm -hmm. This isn't a debate, though. We're going to let the uh, <laughs> panelists answer the question. So capital requirements associated with a given loan would be higher when interest when house prices have been rising rapidly and lower when house prices have been falling. So that is that is you know reciprocal uh, parallel whatever symmetrical, symmetrical perhaps would be the word. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I would say uh, two things. One is we have FHA, which says its role is to be countercyclical, and so it would presumably come in at that uh, point, if we were to get it to be counter-cyclical during the boom time, which it's not, it's pro-cyclical, uh, that's hard to do. But secondly, uh, Congress and the Fed can always be relied on to jump in to be counter-cyclical. <laughs> we don't have to plan for that in advance. They will do that, and they've shown that. And so I think we need to focus on how we make this work better during the boom times, provide some counter-cyclical uh, cap capital provisions and things like that uh, that help during the boom times, um, Congress and, and the Fed, you're, you're going to not be able to keep them on the sidelines, I don't think. They've, they've not shown any ability to, to stay on the sidelines. Anybody else on Josh's question one? Norbert. I do, uh, and not that Congress is going to ditch, ditch Basel, uh, but uh, the Crapo bill, that, that's going to happen. Uh, some version of that's going to happen, that's going to get passed. And that does get, or that does do something to this incentive because for banks under $10 billion who meet the community bank leverage ratio, whatever that ends up looking like, um, th there's, there's that part of it that gets them out of Basel. And then in addition to that, the QM, uh, the QM standard has changed for most of those banks as well, which for anything that you hold, uh, 
uh, automatically as QM. So there is, th those things are not components of the plan itself, but those things are happening. But they're important, I agree. Like, w without all of those things changing, there's less of an impact, and if we could change all of those things, it would be better. All right, now let's come to uh, Josh. Let me, you have one more? Let me okay, add ahead. one more right. feature. Really, the best uh, policy for dealing with uh, really bad times is to prevent exceptionally good times. That's really the best thing that you can do, to have a more stable market that doesn't engender the same kind of uh, potential crash. Great point. Let's come to the question of well, the banks are sitting on all these excess reserves. How does that play into our, uh, into our issue of the ability of the, of the private, we're going to say the private sector, including the banks, to, uh, to, to play a much bigger didn't, role didn't, here. Didn't we have an event on that here? <laughs> we, I, I mean, that, that's another one. I mean, the, the, the Fed's not going to ditch that operating system anytime soon. Um, but it, I, th I mean, I've, I've made the case in my own writing. I know, and I, I am joking, but we, we did have an event here with Paul. Uh, George Selden's written a lot about this. I mean, the interest on excess reserve program is definitely, I would argue, holding back lending. So that is something that needs to be, uh, I won't say, I won't say we need to get rid of it today, but we need to get, we need to plan to get rid of it more quickly, yes. Other than me keep bitching about it, I don't know what's going to happen, though. Banks need to have an incentive to make loans, and competing with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is, is not an incentive. Yes. Okay. Next question right here, and then we'll come over to you. Okay. Hi, Robert Bowes, FHA. Uh, I want to touch on what uh, Tobias put in and what the price effects, where you have um, the private market, portfolio lenders having a, a price advantage right now did you and this is sort of like the ed demarco strategy of like just raise g fees like like uh, ed just mentioned and in the private market would step in um it seems to have been reversed on the single family side on the multifamily side though get back to josh's point you have they, they kept the g fees the multifamily g fees are still super high but but the, bank, the private sector doesn't come in. All, it's all agency. So, and that gets back to the, uh, the capital standards. Multifamily doesn't have the, the Basel rules. So, if, if, you know, doesn't it support Josh's conclusion that you have to do something on Basel III to, to uh, have the banks uh, get back in the business? So, uh, on the multifamily, I, I think what I look at what uh, Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny are doing it's not so much um, the, the, the rate advantage, and there may be some, you know, it's not the same as single family. It's more um, the capitalization ratio and, how, and, and debt to income ratios, how, where they'll allow um, the, those levels to go. Uh, the two colleagues, Tom White and Charlie Wilkins, have done research uh, which shows that what's happened in the last six or seven years as the GSEs and Ginny May have added substantially to uh, the volume that, that was shown earlier, uh, or their share, was that uh, the amount of debt per unit uh, has grown dramatically in inflation-adjusted terms. And so you have a very small increment of multifamily each year. It's like 1%. It's you know teeny tiny increment on the total stock. So the flow of new multifamily relative to the stock is teeny tiny. Yet the increase in debt on that stock has grown dramatically under the uh, leadership or the control of the market of the GSEs and Ginnie Mae. That's not a good outcome because uh, all of that debt is uh, – five, seven, and ten-year balloons by and large. And if rates go up, you've lent heavily in the early years uh, through these high capitalization or low capitalization rates that allows you to borrow more. And at some point, that debt has to be uh, paid, paid back, yet the debt per unit is just ballooning. And, and I sat through, again, many hours of meetings on this as well <laughs> with multifamily lenders who wanted to do more business and said, we just can't compete. Everybody adjusted their, their view of risk after the crash, to be sure, and appropriately. Uh, but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, less so than others. So you, yeah, Robert, so you, uh, hang, hang on. We're going to make you give your microphone back. Where's my, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to take one more question over here, then we'll check in with Ed again on the uh, outside. Oh, here you go. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Tom Carpenter at Wexler Walker uh, Boutique Lobbying Firm in town. I think you lay out a compelling case for how and why, 
but we all live in the practical here in town. And so any plan that has a five, six year horizon that would span potentially multi-administrations, and I think you all admit Congress would be hard pressed to keep their hands off of things. So how do you in actuality, and especially one where you need such coordination so that FHA is reformed at the same time that you lower the conforming loan limits at the GSEs so that you don't have a, a flow. Just in practicality, is there any way to speed this process up? If you talked about, you know, the beginning of this is 2019 when Trump is able to name a new FHA, FHFA director. Is there any way to speed it up so that you can get that down payment and that early trajectory so that you don't have the six year lag where you know, great idea, great start, but no way you could ever actually finish the process uh, and, and, and get with where, you're, where you're trying to go. Okay, uh, thanks. I Peter. I assume you're talking about during the first, a first or second Trump administration through 2024. That was, a, that was actually just a coincidence that we went through 2024. <laughs> but, but of course our point is this, and it's, it's relatively simple, and that is most of the arguments about change are from people who would be hurt by change. That happens in ev every time you try to deregulate something, the people who are regulated are against deregulation. And so if we can get the first few years done in which we have eliminated some of these restrictions that, that um, or some of these activities and services that the GSEs provide but are not helping the market, after a period of time, people will say, well, my goodness, what do we need them for? And so the efforts by a later administration to come in and say, well, let's restore the government here. Let's make sure the government is back into the housing finance market uh, will be inhibited because the, many people will say, we don't need the government. It's working well without the government. And most of these statements that the sky will fall, and Ed talked about some of them, um, in his remarks, the sky will fall if we make this change. There will, there will be a catastrophe. It will turn out to be false. So I think that's the, the, the ace in the hole, so to speak, that we have in getting these things done. Some of them, can, they can't all be done at the same time. Maybe you can't do the FHA and what we're doing at the same time, but we can do some of them. And as we eliminate the government's role, uh, more and more people will support the idea of eliminating the government's role. Tobias? Yes, and the, and the balance that we're trying to strike here is to, um, you know, if, you, if this happened all at once, there's a significant chance they would do significant damage to the market just because the private sector may not be ready to come up with these immense amounts of money that we're talking about. But if you kind of do this gradually, you'll give the private market time to adjust over time and kind of fill in the void that's left by the GSE. So. I, I would add that I think uh, what we're suggesting is it's time to drain the uh, government housing swamp. And who better to do that than the current president uh, who knows uh, uh, housing and real estate better than any president uh, in, the, in the, our history. Uh, that's what needs to be done. We have to drain the government housing swamp because it's, it's doing bad things. Um, so. You have questions? Uh, I do. Ed from the computer. So, Michael Del Orfano is asked, is there any plan or interest in promoting local state level privatization of housing finance where equity growth for aspiring home buyers is the principal goal? I'm not exactly sure what the local privatization is, but we think the, what we're suggesting with the lift home, the low income first time home buyer tax credit, uh, requiring that those loans be 20 years or less and then using the, the credit to help equalize, substantially equalize, very substantially equalize the buying power, uh, but reduce the risk at the same time. Uh, then once you put that in place, then, then state agencies could work with that, uh, with the private sector and move that forward as long as it's with 20 year loans or less. The key is uh, to get this leverage down and still allow these entry level buyers to enter the market, but not do so in a way that keeps driving the prices up, which is what, what we've done. Ed, can I just add one comment on that? So we, we definitely think there's a lot of um, scope for <clears throat> state housing finance agencies to be proactive in providing incentives for low and moderate income borrowers in their states to take out loans that build wealth. 
virtually all the state housing finance agency programs now for first time and other buyers. They're all um, based on 30-year loans that um, amortize very slowly and that don't really fulfill the wealth building um, objective. But they certainly could be part of the solution um, along with the things that Ed is saying. Do you have another question you want to do there? Uh, yes, it was um, Tobias, can you talk about the better data that's available now that would help uh, inform? Yeah, I mean, in our, it's also in the appendix, appendix um, one, we talk about the AI indices um, where we have data for. And right now we have about 99% of all the GSE loans that get securitized that, we, that show up in our data. So that's a very easy thing to track. Um, likewise, um, now with um, service data provided by CoreLogic or Black Knight, you have also a very good sense of what's happening in the market where um, um, these, these data cover, cover a lot of the market and um, with pretty good detail. And um, yeah, we've been using these data, as you can see, um, over time. And um, we are very comfortable that going forward we'll be able to monitor what's happening to the, to the GSEs, but then also to the private side. And um, yeah. Thank you. Let me come back here. Questions? Anybody? In the back here? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Eugenio Alleman, um, Wells Fargo Securities. Um, a question, I, I haven't read the paper, so normally, I mean, I'm not as old as my beard shows that <laughs> to know why the GSCs were created, but my guess is that it was because there was, there was no construction for the low-income uh, individual to buy a home. Uh, what are the incentives that you have in this plan to yeah. generate? Uh, I mean, uh, construction companies, I mean, builders build homes with uh, bells and whistles because they are the more, most profitable ones. Uh, so what do you have in the plan to incentivize low uh, uh, entry level. price, yeah, entry construction. Level. Lower yeah. price houses, yeah. okay? That's right to you, I think. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I mentioned a few things. Um, one was uh, for FHA, um, the new construction could be uh, limited to uh, 1,800 square foot homes and below, uh, and that would uh, uh, provide an incentive to uh, builders. There's a large subsidy that FHA uh, has. Ed, you um, might mention when FHA was created, yeah. the size of housing. Yeah, when FHA that were was created, financed. and this again gets back to government housing policy. When FHA was created in 1934, the data that I have goes back to the late 40s, early 50s, but the average size of the house um, well, actually, it was about 1,000 square feet. Uh, somebody asked me, uh, uh, I think actually Robert in the audience, I think might have asked me, um, was there ever a, uh, a commission or proposal that was made where the actual recommendation led to what your question just asked, actually serving the entry level? And I first said no, and I said, wait a minute, there was the 1931 Hoover Commission um, that basically said what's needed is you have to build houses that are affordable uh, expand the supply to, and build new houses that are affordable for the median income. And they went through the math and it ended up being a house of a certain amount and that got you a certain square footage, which at that time might have been 800 or 900 square feet. And FHA in 1934, and I have the brochures to prove it, came out with houses that were just like that in that at that price point. That all changed uh, in the 1950s um, and as I mentioned with the 30 year coming in and lower down payments and the size of the homes. There was a proposal in the 1995 National Home Ownership Strategy. Uh, we have to reduce the size of homes being built so that you have more entry level. And that didn't happen. The size just kept increasing. So we've suggested the FHA could be targeted. We've suggested the lift home could be targeted on new construction to uh, 1,800 square foot homes and below. Uh, and we've suggested that if you uh, build, uh, if you uh, uh, bring more people safely in as uh, home buyers through Lift Home, you're going to free up low income apartments. And those apartments are going to be uh, cost uh, at a price point without subsidies that's quite low as compared to the very expensive and large uh, lift, uh, low income housing tax credit development. So, those are just three examples of how we would accomplish that. Thanks very much for the good question. Uh, Bert, you've had a turn. Let me see if there's someone who hasn't. Over here, please. 
Um, Una MacDonald, independent consultant and author. A um, couple of questions. Are there enough incentives for increasing supply? I think the twin effects of your own proposals, which I agree with in terms of lowering house prices, uh, plus the tax changes, which I think will be longer and slower in effect than just the opening months of this year. Are there enough incentives for rebuilding? Second question, I have a lot of comments I'd like to make, Alex, but I certainly don't wish to give a lecture of any kind whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my second question is, time to really challenge the GSEs and say, why do you just justify your existence when no other housing market in the world has a similar structure, except for one or two countries, I think one is Thailand, where American consultants have obviously advised GSEs <laughs> to be part of the housing market, a familiar approach to me. Una, but thank you for that why excellent not just point. challenge them? The UK e market doesn't need it, for example. Excellent point in the form of a question, Una, thank you. <laughs> Uh, On the first on supply, uh, one additional thing that our plan has is, is the suggestion that uh, the second home uh, deduction, more agency deduction, be eliminated. That would actually free up second homes, which are interchangeable in many cases with uh, primary residences and would increase supply that's already existing. It tends to be relatively lower cost supply. Um, the average uh, second home that gets financed is about $200,000. Uh, there are other things that are needed, but the federal government is very limited in what it can do in this area, and so I hesitate to suggest other things. I've thought long and hard about them, but it's very hard to think of things the federal government could do without creating new problems that actually make the problem worse than, than uh, we started out at. Certainly, at a local level, you have to start peeling back all of the myriad regulations that have accreted over time that drive up the price of housing, both single family and multifamily, but that's a different um, uh, conference. Peter? That, that question was from Una McDonald, who has written an excellent book years and years ago before uh, Ed and I did some work on this subject about Fannie and Freddie. Um, it was uh, uh, remarkable because it was written by someone who was living in England at the time, and it was quite comprehensive. Um, in Una, we are fortunate to know, is now living in, in uh, the United States, so we are able to get her questions. But one of the things you asked about was, why do we have this in the United States when no other country has anything like that except Thailand? And um, if you're familiar with path dependency, you would understand why we have it, because we started with the, with the at least with Fannie, in, in 1938, uh, for the purpose of helping banks get rid of the mortgages that they were making. Um, and after the banks made the mortgage, they had nothing, they had to hold the mortgage, and that meant they didn't have enough cash to make further mortgages, so Fannie was, um, was authorized to buy these mortgages from the bank. Well, once you create an agency of any kind, it will find a role for itself in the future. And so one of the things that we have to recognize is that when we do this, um, we are creating something of a precedent which we c it will become very difficult to undo. I think on that note, we're about to the end, but I want to give the panelists uh, a chance for any final uh, parting shot they might wish to make. Peter, that was an excellent one right there. Anybody else? I, I think regarding that last question, uh, if you take uh, paper, take extra copies of the paper um, or send electronic uh, copies of the paper, we have provided the blueprint for answering that precise question. As I said earlier, you know, there's no there there when it comes to the GSEs. They are not providing anything, anything positive to the housing market, full stop. And we've shown why they're dangerous, why they've been dangerous in the past, why they'll be dangerous again, uh, working in concert with FHA, why that is a problem and how this uh, plan can be implemented uh, safely, soundly, and lead to a better result uh, for taxpayers, for Treasury, and very particularly for low and moderate income households who are trying to uh, buy their first home. Uh, that's the principle that we articulated as the purpose of government involvement, and we stick by that principle, and we think our plan does precisely that. Thank you, Ed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us, and let's thank our excellent speakers. Thank you.